This conference will now be recorded. For the skills stations, you know, they can show you anything. They will show like uh, seven or eight different items they can show you. They can give you a CTG. They can, they can give you some other devices that comment on them. What are these? Why we use them? They can show you different surgical instruments. They can show you sutures. They can bring like I used to be. Yeah. You took for doctor? I'm carrying all. This conference will now be recorded. Hello. Yes. Yes. Hi. Like for this first station, mm -hmm. uh, they will give you multiple tasks. Like uh, if we have this CTG. So we will ask you that can you comment on this CTG? I will enlarge mm. it for you. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. So this is the CTG. They didn't mm. give you any patient info any info on the patient they just gave you this ctg and mm -hmm. they will ask you to comment on this one mm -hmm. so what do you think what's happening here yes um uh, we uh, comment on the ctg depend on the uh, dr c uh, c bravado uh, mnemonic and first we should take a brief history and determine if there is any risk factors for that patient if she is having preterm labor if there is infection or uh, meconium or iugr or any to identify if there is any risk uh, okay and uh, then um, we will comment on the contractions the patient she's having uh, some uh, mild irregular contractions uh, like uh, two to three in ten minutes, and uh, uh, two to three in ten minutes, and uh, then uh, for the fetal heart, it's uh, the baseline is 120 beats per minute uh, with uh, good variability. It's about uh, five to ten uh, beats per minute, and uh, there is uh, or there is uh, yeah there is some minimal ac some accelerations are there. And there are some variable decelerations. It's about, uh, yani almost, um, oh, uh, more than 50% of the contractions for all for the trace, which is about uh, maybe this is 30 minutes. Uh, about 30 minutes. Uh, so it is uh, like uh, one non-reassuring sign. So it's non-reassuring. The overall is not reassuring CTG. Okay. So, you know, they just ask you that comment on this CTG, okay? So when you want to comment, I agree with you that we use that in the morning, Dr. C. Mm -hmm. Pravito, that we could determine the risk, and then we should proceed. That mm -hmm. there are contractions, what is the baseline, so, you know, and other things. So when you comment, they are you are asked to comment on any CTG. First thing you should see is, do you have any patient identifier here? The name should be here. Okay. Then what is the mm -hmm. date? Date and time. We are very important. Date is mentioned here, 11 1 2005. And then you should see the paper speed. It is mentioned here. If you can appreciate, one centimeter per minute. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't speed because some in some machines the paper will run at two centimeters per minute so we can misinterpret okay so you are good when you said that we need we we need a brief patient history so this is a skill station so they will not give you details they will just ask you to comment on this one so now, now tell me that uh, what sort of uh, decelerations are these you will say that these are uh, there are decelerations what is the baseline for you this is 100, 120. 120. Yeah, 120. 120. Mm. It's in the reference. So you can see D cells. So what sort of D cells are these? These are variable. 
yeah these are variable so and then you should see that what is the duration of uh, you know this recording so it, it has been continued for like 15 minutes right? so you should say that mm -hmm. it, uh, this, this is a trace of the fetal heart for 20 minutes 30 minutes or whatever the time duration and these are the findings that these are there are variable decelerations and mm -hmm. i can see that there are mild contractions and she's contracting at a rate of three in ten minutes so the next question is what action you should take now if someone is having a ctg like this then what action should you mm -hmm. take? Mm, yes. Okay. So what should we do now? Because this CTG is not a uh, good one. Mm -hmm. We have some concern here. No, but if it is uh, if it is less than thirty minutes, then we cannot say that it is non reassuring. We have to extend more uh, the CTG. Uh, at least for 30 minutes to can uh, decide if this deceleration continues or not. But if suppose this is uh, already 30 minutes trace, we have we have the same trace. Uh, so it is for 30 minutes these decelerations are there, then that is non-reassuring. So we should start resuscitation. We will check the patient temperature. We will uh, give her IV fluid. Maybe she is dehydrated. We will keep her on the side position. And if she's on centosinone infusion, then we can reduce the cento or stop the centosinone and uh, watch the CTG. And if it is improved, then that will be fine. If it didn't improve, then we can go for a you know, it depend on also the uh, how, what is the gestational age and uh, what is the VE findings for her. If she is more than four centimeters and she is more than 34 weeks, then we can go for um uh, fetal scalp sampling if it continued like uh, 50 minutes like that then we can go for fetal scalp sampling okay okay thank you that's how you should comment on this ctg because <laughs> you know this is a just a skin station so they will not give you extra time and there will be at least five tasks okay can be more but usually never uh, i've never seen them that they are asking about like five or six things usually they will keep like seven eight tasks will be there so that's why we have to be uh, you know we don't have to go into details we will just comment on that okay thank mm -hmm. you very much dr zaida yeah hello how are you? hi good yeah, morning how are you? good morning dr zaida yeah nicely i can catch up you all because I was held up. I was on call yesterday. That's it. Okay. If I get the this is also a problem for the doctors. You know, very hard to prepare. Because suddenly, at the last moment, yeah, I requested a leave, so they just gave me today and the first day. And then, yeah. So let's hope that we can make good use of this time. Yeah. So today, you know, we are talking about uh, skin stations. And mm -hmm. what sort of things they can show you? Okay. okay. So here is one report. Mm -hmm. This is the condition of the patient, her description. So you can mm -hmm. see that uh, once you finish reading this page, then please tell me. I will scroll it. Uh, okay. paper and then you can read the rest mm -hmm. of the station. So they are basically asking you that what's wrong? Can you find any abnormality in the test results? Mm -hmm. So they they will give you normal ranges also. Okay. So don't be in a hurry, just to have a look at the report and then see that is it still in the reference range? Okay. Or it is mildly increased, moderately or severely increased.
Ya. So she's RH negative. Yeah. So platelet count is uh, platelet count is ten. Hundred eighty. No, 100. it's eighty only. Eighty. Eighty. Okay. Then the level is one point eight. Okay. So, what do you think? Uh, patient is anemic uh, still, and uh, uh, yeah, her hemoglobin is 8.9. With postpartum period, it should be uh, at least 10. Okay, and her PT and APTT is a little on the higher side. So, since she has bled quite a lot intraoperative and postoperatively, likely. Uh, 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 could be a DIC, but platelet counts are uh, are also on the lower side. It's about 80, and the WBCs are on the higher side, which is 29. So some foci of infection can be there, and uh, um, yeah. So you think we need to give her anything? Uh, urine is clear, draining equally, minimal blood loss, most recent blood tests. Uh, we need to build up a hemoglobin, but they are not uh, very uh, less. It is it is on the lower side, maybe oral iron uh, therapy. And I would like to know about her vital signs and uh, her temperature and uh, uh, pulse as well to rule out because the WBC counts are on the higher side. So just to know if there's any infection. And her PT and APTT are on the higher side, uh, is raised. So again, and she has a minimal trickling of uh, blood. And uh, uh, could be patient is in DIC. Actually, if you will look at this one, APTT 39. is slightly so on the okay, higher side, yeah. So it is going to the higher side. So Platelets, outside this yeah. normally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Platelets, okay. And uh, this will be no genius one. So we yeah, need to give But not her... less than 50. She's not, uh, platelets are not less than 50. So I don't think she requires a platelet transfusion. But uh, fibrinogen is above 1.5. So that's fine. But uh, PT, is raised. Okay. So, so, from in time, also, you know, slightly not elevated. A half time. Yeah, not more than one and a half times raised. It is less than one and a half times. So, do you think she needs fresh frozen plasma? Need, yeah, fresh frozen plasma and need to build up a hemoglobin. I think that will. Uh, help her to reduce the uh, little trickle of bleeding. But platelets need not be because uh, it's okay. We, uh, it doesn't follow the criteria for the transfusion. Yeah. And uh, fibrinogen level should be kept at above 2 grams One per point. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this is, we are giving this reference range, but the recommended mm -hmm. one is so we need to give her Fresh frozen yeah. plasma. plasma, yeah. Because no, anyhow, she is urine is clear, everything is fine. Mm -hmm. And but she had this main descriptor for hemorrhage, so that's why she had it was significant hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. That is okay, so it gave her fresh frozen plasma. So mm -hmm. maybe the DIC is setting it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So the next case is for. Dr. Asma.
So what is her problem? What is the abnormality in the report? I think. Can you hear me, please? OK. I think Dr. Asma is not there. So anyone would like to comment on this one? Is the abnormality in this report? Which one, Dr. Aisha? This one, Sam yeah, Good morning. Welcome, Sam. How are you? <laughs> Hi. Yeah. I woke up seven and then I slept again. <laughs> it's, okay. it's OK. The way you are here. Yeah. 19 year old Caucasian in her first pregnancy compliant with antenatal care staying in a woman's hostel for the homeless She smokes 20 to 25 cigarettes intravenous abuser and methadone withdrawal program her booking hormonal electrophoresis HBA and H2 36 weeks pregnant so her MCV, uh, her, uh, sorry, hemoglobin is low. Then uh, the right cell count is high. Platelet count is, is OK. MCV is low. And PCV is low. And MCH is also low. So it looks like uh, uh, she has all the parameters for hemoglobin and absolute values are low. So she has anemia. And uh, because all parameters are low, uh, there can be possibility of thalassemia also. Uh, but we have to differentiate from iron deficiency anemia and thalassemia. See, I'm there, yeah. there is electrophoresis. Yeah. The is normal the levels of uh, okay, okay. Yeah, so this is iron deficiency anemia then. Yeah. So Severe um, iron I'm, deficiency anemia because it is 7.7 .7 hemoglobin. Yes, this is iron deficiency, but the thing you said first that uh, by definition, we will call it thalassemia. Uh, you know, in case of thalassemia, patient will have anemia in the presence of all normal indices. That is the basic definition of thalassemia, OK? So this one satisfies uh, satisfies that definition because you know, this will, uh, Can you repeat, Dr. Aisha? that your patient will have normal parameters like they will mm -hmm. be on the lower side but still they will be in the reference range and mm -hmm. still your patient will have uh, anemia so then you have to think about thalassemia okay only this uh, so but in cases here you know your main clue should not come from this hemoglobin level you should focus on mcv mcv yeah. that is the basic criteria here they are saying 78 to 100 okay this is the this is for the sake of example but uh, mm -hmm. if you go to the normal levels like uh, international levels they say that if the uh, mcv is less than 70 think about microcytic anemia between 70 to 90 that is the reference range more than 90 think about macrocytic anemia which can be due to deficiency of folates or due to deficiency of vitamin b12 so basically this girl is anemic and she has uh, you know, her, that's why, you know, they gave you all this description that uh, mm -hmm. she was an addict and she is, you know, uh, underprivileged. She's yeah, homeless care home. She's in a care malnourished. Home. So uh, she's having this. Her food is not good. So she has this anemia. So less than because 70 micro. You said that we think of uh, uh, this one iron deficiency and 70 to 90. Mi no, sorry, less than 70 microcytic. Yeah, Less 70 to 90, 90 normal, normal and 90 and above we think of macrocytic anemia. Macrocytic anemia can there can be folate deficiency or vitamin B12 deficiency, like the person is pure vegetarian. That is the point. So, in thalassemia, I think MCV is not that much low. I think, in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. Thalassemia. That's they will be in the that's that's why I said that in thalassemia, all blood uh, results will be normal. Normal. But still, your patient will be anemic. That is the point. Okay, they will be. But uh, it will uh, be in the uh, lower range, I think. All the people will be in the lower range. In the lower range. Yeah. Like MCV will be maybe 72, 74, even 78. Okay, but still, your patient will have signs and clinical signs and symptoms of anemia, fatigue, mm, okay. tiredness, and you know they will have like. If we will talk about thalassemia also because I have some slides to show you. We'll talk about that also. So basically, you know, 
uh, we are practicing these skills they can ask you different type of questions like we started here i will just show you the first document ctg then we talked about another patient who just underwent this c section and she had placenta previa and accreta and significant hemorrhage cell salvage was done and this is her uh, result so here activated partial thromboplastin time was raised and then you know the, this wpc count is 29.8 so after cesarean section the uh, wbc count can be up to 25000 you will not think that that is a problem because uh, there is excessive stress on the body acute stress so a uh, wbc count can rise tremendously 16000 in case of normal delivery is accepted as normal and uh, in cases of cesarean section 25000 is the normal limit so but here fibrogen <laughs> is less than 2 so uh, she yeah. will be cryoprecipitated so we should give her fibrogen also cryoprecipitated Yeah, right, that's correct. Because uh, Irish guideline says from the start that uh, it is preferable that if fibrinogen level is kept towards the higher level, so we can give her fibrinogen. Okay. Yeah. Even R C G also changed to two gram per liter. You know, because yeah. before it was one point five, now they changed to two gram per liter. Two. Yes. So we are going to stick to this new information that it should be kept at two. And. Uh, so anything which is deficient you will say that we, if this level is low so then they will ask you so what should be done you will say that give her fibrinogen so then it is a skill station and you are going to answer like seven to nine questions they are going to show you slides in a rapid sequence so don't have to go into details okay but can i show the ctg one the first one the ctg one there is no history this is now. early decelerations early decelerations these are the see this one i will say is early but mm -hmm. this one i like we can say that we will uh, we will uh, comment like uh, uh, following the drc bravado and um, uh, we will just matlab we can for the time being say early and then we will continue the ctg if still it is like this then we will reassess the patient you know so before you they commented that some of them was variable were variable also because i will see i can see that two or three are early and but you know if you would go for this one here this one is slightly a uh, slightly late than this one if you would go to this one this one is also you know the maximum point is different so we said that we have like two three variable d cells and two three early d cells so like i uh, i just told them that first you have to see that patient identifiers are there then what is the paper speed what is the what uh, the time yes, here yes. what is the time date here, yeah. and the paper speed is very important otherwise you can easily misinterpret it okay so this is the ctg and then see for how long uh, this trip is given what was the duration this, this is in between two lines 10 minutes and then 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 it is 17 minutes almost yeah so it should be like it should be more than 30 minutes or preferably it should be for 45 minutes to comment on this one but if you find any abnormality you should take resuscitative measures no leave the patient alone okay we will not wait for the 45 minute period we will start resuscitation like we will so do we will... left lateral and iv hydration uh, i don't know in yeah. rcg they are not giving oxygen in um, rcpi yeah. they are giving oxygen RCPI is guideline is just like the 2007 intrapartum care guideline um, by NICE, like the old NICE guideline. And as you know that RCOG, this new NICE guideline also went back to that previous guideline, second edition of this guideline. So again, 110 to 160, and variation of 25 to 5 weeks. Then, and uh, but they are still. Uh, So we're considering these accelerations. There should be accelerations, but as we know, accelerations are not there, okay? and there should be no decelerations. So they also say that you have to give oxygen, but now it will have no effect on the CTG. It will just correct hypoxemia in the mother. That's why they will. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And otherwise, no effect on the baby. Okay, Doctor Asma, are you there? This is the. Yes, doctora. 
So this patient is this next test result is for you. They can mm -hmm. show you different results. We will also practice with different investigations, but today I I am showing you these anemia mm. blood reports for different mm -hmm. patients. Um, mm -hmm. So you will look at this one and then you will comment that what is the abnormality in this case? Yes, uh, that is a postpartum patient who had a postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, she lost 600 ml of blood and she fainted and uh, then she looks pale. Um, normal blood pressure, pulse rate is normal and the uterus is uh, contracted. Look here is normal, uh, breastfed and all. Okay, her hemoglobin is 8.6, so definitely for postpartum it's low because uh, it's written here 11.5, but uh, postpartum it is 10. Uh, the normal uh, hemoglobin should be 10. Uh, WBC is little high, so this is accepted for the postpartum patient. Platelet is high. MCV is 80, that is normal. Uh, and MCH is 29, that is all normal. Mm. Yeah, and bleated and WBCs are high. Um, what, about the level of platelets? Hmm? what what about the level of platelets? It is yeah, it's a high. Plate, this is what I'm saying. It's a high thrombocytosis. Thrombocytosis. Um, Mm. What do you suspect here? Uh, yeah, somatosis. So what can be the cause of so this is uh, due to hemorrhage? Maybe. Yes. Mm. So, no, I'm not have... really sure. Mm. No problem. Don't give up. Just you know, think logically. She's mm -hmm. anemic. She mm -hmm. has some. Effect. She's on the postnatal ward. She and they, didn't, they didn't mention here that she has uh, that she had a cesarean delivery. Right? Then you know if the platelet count is so high, so there is thrombocytosis, and the blood flow will be sluggish. So at 8.6 hemoglobin, she will not be symptomatic. She's 33, young woman, right? So most likely mm -hmm. there is. Blood is very thick and maybe she will develop a clot and blood flow is very sluggish. Okay, so you should get and she, she has infection also. Maybe she's first of all before starting any treatment, you have to see that uh, how she is behave, behaving. Like, uh, what is the clinical condition? Is she dehydrated? Because if you look at BP, the diastolic is 66, still normal, but uh, towards the lower side. And the pulse rate is fine. First of all, you need to see that the patient is well hydrated or not. But obviously, there is some infection and this high platelet count. So maybe she has some um, thrombophilia, some problem is there, or maybe hemoconcentration is there. So she should be fully evaluated. And, uh, maybe she will need some um, heparin, molecular weight heparin. So you should get her review. Give her, send her, blood, you know, blood for culture and sensitivity, and antibiotics should be started. Mm. So, and yeah, okay. the possible causes are uh, infection or uh, dehydration. Infection, dehydration, because they are telling you mm. 100 ml postpartum hemorrhage, and she had a rotational forceps delivery. So, rotational forceps deliveries. They are associated with, sometimes they are associated with significant trauma and her uterus is involuting, so they told you that there is no hematopalpus, nothing. So, mm -hmm. but this shows some infection and maybe hemoconcentration because the platelet count is very high. So, mm -hmm. we need to dehydrate the patient and we need to start antibiotics and she should be reviewed by the hematologist because 545 is very high. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> She can have sickle cell, Dr. Raisha, if uh, uh, because but electrophoresis is not given. So sickle sickler cell anemia. And sickler and also, she, you know, in cases of thalassemics, again, the platelet count can be up to 600. So, but they, did, but they didn't mention in the history. 
so that's why i said that give her iv fluids or let her drink to her thirst and then send blood for culture and sensitivity and see what is the clinical condition but if they ask you about the normality there are two things are abnormal very high wbc count and second thing is thrombocytosis should be reviewed by the hematologist because uh, you know uh, we, uh, they didn't give us any history anything so we need further evaluation for this patient but if they ask you to spot the abnormalities these are very high wbcs and very high platelets so and then you know this one looks slightly relevant uh, relatively unusual because in cases of patient for such deliveries usually the hemorrhage is greater than this one so we don't know if he has a hematoma or some problem but they didn't mention anything so this patient needs full evaluation but if you are commenting only on these um, blood counts then there are two abnormalities but we will say anemia also because uh, 86 hemoglobin like mild anemia yeah all these three parameters are abnormal mild anemia and uh, at this age, at this blood level if you know at this hemoglobin level if your patient is symptomatic so you think you should give her blood or you should investigate yeah. her we will not that she may blood. be uh, compensate maybe she is compensating uh, if she is not symptomatic then after some time she can have she can desaturate so maybe she has yeah, some, you know this um, hematoma because why they told you that she had a rotation delivery it was more traumatic so evaluate her full inspection examination and then you know if she is febrile because they didn't mention her temperature they just gave her you know if you will look at this one she looks pale so she has evidence of bleeding okay so this is the blood pressure she is trying to compensate for it and pulse rate is also fine but they didn't comment on her temperature so we need to take her temperature also because maybe she is febrile okay and she is symptomatic maybe she is dehydrated and she is looking pale maybe she is forming a hematoma so this patient needs full evaluation and then uh, you know we should get her reviewed by the hematologist also to see that why this uh, platelet count is very high maybe undiagnosed thrombocytosis or maybe she is she has some hereditary thrombophilia maybe she is thalassemic or maybe she has sickle. but you know in sicklers hemoglobin will not be this much especially after yeah, any yeah, yeah. sort of heavy bleeding see so that's why you know to answer one question you have to recall so many things okay so in the lab results they will just show you some the results and then they will ask you that what is the abnormality here what should be done next they are like single best answers that uh, start iv antibiotics hydrate her and get a review by the hematologist and exclude hematoma formation because she is looking pale and she is symptomatic and she was feeling dizzy feeling pain after going to the bathroom so can be postural hypotension also so these are the abnormalities so first we have to start with the simple measures send for further investigations take her temperature first of all but um, for the diagnosis of fever it is not essential that the temperature should be high because uh, the patient should have other symptoms also okay um, we agree that the temperature on two occasions if it is more than 37.5 then we have to think about fever and sometimes if the fever temperature is 38 we will not assume that she has some infection maybe it's around finding or sometimes due to effects of presence of this progesterone temperature can be high so always you have to correlate vital signs with the like clinical condition of the patient and help me see also that what exactly happened and then after combining all of these things then you can make some conclusion my reference is this rcg guideline on on maternal collapse it says that if you see if that temperature is 38 don't assume that she has a fever she is running a fever or she has sepsis Learn, pay attention to other vital signs also so here to begin with check her temperature um send blood for culture and sensitivity start iv antibiotics and 
correct the issues be hydrated and uh, after that get her reviewed by the hematologist okay. dr zahida yeah. are you yeah dr aisha yeah yes please so they will show you a picture or they can actually show you some, some different types of forceps or vacuum then one instrument okay, they can ask you what is this so can you tell me what's going on in here this is a forceps delivery uh, uh, it's a yeah, the arrow showing towards the forceps. I'm outlet forceps. Uh, yeah. It has got a shank. Um, like they want me to explain the forceps in this. It has got a shank uh, handle. Uh, yeah. Then, what are the indications, contraindications, and criteria? So basically, they are asking you once you will say that this is they are trying to deliver the baby with forceps. So, what forceps. are they? they are contemplating instrumental mm. delivery? Mm. Yeah, okay. So, it's then a... this is at mid cavity level or outlet forceps? Yeah, outlet for uh, it, it is at the mid, mid cavity level. Outlet forceps we don't use right nowadays, mm -hmm. do we? Uh, so yeah, sometimes they do. You know, they will use these wrigley's or outlet forceps sometimes when the mm. head is not working, or you know, if they need attraction of like the less than 45, then they will use the mm. outlet. Mm -hmm. in, in our countries and in Gulf, they don't use forceps very frequently, but in the Western world, mm. uh, they are still using all different types of forceps, and uh, vacuum is not used very frequently. This is the difference, okay? Even oh. for we do not usually use vacuum extractor, but they will use these forceps, okay? So mm -hmm. basically, they are. Uh, so you should say that they are mimicking the movement, natural movements, and they are going in a reverse J or inverted J fashion. So then they can ask you, yeah, you should know about the indications. When do we offer? instrumental mm -hmm. delivery. It's got maternal like, fetal indications. Uh, uh, indications for forceps delivery. Maternal indications, yes, poor bearing down, cut short second stage in case of cardiac diseases like NYHA class 3 and 4. Then uh, uh, then uh, uh, fetal indications like fetal distress. Then uh, Then um, you know, uh, when the head is there, she is fully dilated. Hypertension, and severe hypertensive crisis. Yeah. Hypertension, you can do that. Whenever you want to shorten the second stage of labor, you can do that. So you should say yeah. that you can do because of maternal indications or you can do because of fetal, fetal, fetal indications. indications. Maternal indication, exhaustion, okay? Or mm -hmm. she has some medical condition due to which she mm -hmm. cannot continue pushing and wall salva maneuver is not good for her okay? like he is a cardiac patient but uh, in grade three and grade in class three and class four of new york heart association classification due to fetal reasons if there is fetal distress mm -hmm. and you need to accomplish delivery in a quick way in less than 30 minutes so the benefit is that in cesarean you will still take some time but here you can achieve it quickly so what are the prerequisites for doing OVT? First thing is that uh, prerequisites. First, uh, 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 patient's bladder should be empty, lithotomy position after taking uh, informed consent, verbal consent. And uh, head should not uh, less than one fifth palpable per abdomen. Membrane should be ruptured. Then uh, proper position of the sutures uh, should be assessed and uh, there should no, not be excessive cap put or molding then uh, then uh, pre uh, pre presentation should be properly identified uh, mm -hmm. the, the, then uh, um, uh, and uh, neonatology should be informed and in case of failure the theater should be kept ready 
for uh, operative uh, for uh, cesarean section and a person who has got an expertise in uh, doing a forceps delivery and have uh, attained sufficient competency should uh, do it and it can be done in the theater or it can be done in the labor room depend upon depending upon the criteria yeah and you are taking consent from the woman yeah yes. and you need to explain to her that what exactly you are going to do Mm -hmm. And membranes should be ruptured, and there should be no contraindication to vaginal delivery. Delivery. Yeah, so then we can proceed. Mm -hmm. So, how many different types of forceps we can use? We have the outlet, the mid cavity, and the rotation uh, rotational forceps. High forceps we don't use. Yeah, that is. So. Actually, when we are talking about the indication, so he should be at plus two station or more. Mm -hmm. and if it is at plus two or more, then you should see that you will do this delivery in the delivery speed. If it is between mm -hmm. plus one and plus two, you will go to OR. Or if he needs a traction of more than 45, go to the theater. Mm -hmm. And if he is about between zero and plus one, then you should abandon this idea and you should go for a cesarean section so then another thing you know you should always mention this abdominal palpation also most of the candidates they will just talk about the findings on ve but you need to tell them that you will do this abdominal examination after evacuating her bladder and you will see that way uh, there is a fetal head if you can feed one fifth of fetal head then still you can apply forceps but if you are able to feel two fifths of the fetal head then you should abandon this idea of instrumental delivery because head is way high so you need to deliver by cesarean section then go to the vaginal examination see that she is fully dilated head is well applied membranes have been ruptured she has no indication to no contraindication for vaginal delivery and uh, she's suitable and you will respect her wishes. So then you will do that. So what is the advantage of using forceps over vacuum? What is the advantage of forceps over the vacuum? Yeah, uh, cha, I think with advantage, it is quick uh, mm -hmm. compared to the forceps and uh, uh, failure rate is less compared to the vacuum uh, 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 delivery and it can be applied in uh, preterm um, above 30, uh, more than 34 weeks and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah I will agree with you that if it is less baby is uh, less than 34 weeks you can apply forceps but vacuum should not be applied then second thing is whenever you are doing a vacuum extension you need mother mother to push with you she will have a contraction she should push and then you should pull so maternal effort is required but if she is unable to push like if she has a cardiac disease or or she is down you know she, she was starting this that's easier for her she is drowsy she cannot push so then forceps can be applied that is a benefit because for forceps we don't need any maternal efforts because you, know, you are just going to pull the baby with contraction that is the basic difference okay and uh, then the types you were justified in saying that we have rotational and non-rotational so for the non-rotational you can have low cavity outlet forceps like wigglies and uh, which are short and light and they are used when the head is on the perineum at plus three you just have uh, need a little uh, effort to lift the baby head out of the pelvis mid cavity forceps they can be of different types you don't have to remember their names just say that we use when the sagittal suture is in the anteroposterior plane or at least not more than 45 degree from the midline that is called the mid cavity then we can use rotational forceps and mostly killant forceps. We, these are used. So they have a reduced pelvic curve and you can allow rotation about the axis of the handle. So where you need rotation deli deliveries, you will use killant forceps. If they ask you to identify, then you see this is a rigid forceps. 
we can see the curves and short handle because we are just using for the outlet deliveries. Level pass we are using in, in cases of uh, nowadays, you know, I've never I'm not, not seen anyone using them, but previous indication was uh, these are used to deliver the after coming head in cases of freeze presentation. And this is Kiran Forceps. You can see the locks, the shaft, you know, that you can lock it. And they are heavy and they have got a uh, long and this shaft and handle also. So if they ask you to describe, forget that what is the name of his sports switch, just you should tell them these are the blades, blades. curves, okay. this is the shank, this is the fixed block, and this is the handle. So if if they ask you which blade you will insert first, so you will insert the right left one or the left one. Or the left, the left one. blade followed by the right one. Yes. That's correct. And then, okay, then you should know that what should be the position. This is the correct position. Okay. It should be like this. If we have a lecture view, then you will find something like this. So if they give you a dummy and doll, always uh, say that you will take consent, you will explain the procedure. What is the benefit and what are the risks? Benefit is that we can achieve a quick delivery if the baby is compromised. Disadvantages are that she can have bulbal and vaginal care. And she can have thyroid force to give perinatal care, and baby can have this facial nerve palsy, or they, they can ha have marks or bruises on their forehead. Or the That's all you can use them, and then rotate them and take them. Okay, thank you. Next one for Dr. Pari. Yes, Dr. Aisha. Dr. Aisha, just can you repeat the stations again? Uh, this one, uh, you told the stations and false it. Yeah, come back. They will just show you this one. They will ask you what, what's going on here. Uh, stations, the present, where is the head? If it is at uh, between, the head is between 0 and plus 1, then you should not do instrumental delivery. If it is between plus one and plus two, then you should take the patient to the OR and uh, you will use maybe this rotational forceps. If it is plus two or plus three, then you are going to conduct delivery in the delivery room and you will use outlet forceps. If the head is at zero, you should just uh, abandon this idea of instrumental delivery and go for a cesarean section. But this key lens will be applied uh, uh, one and two in between one and two. Yeah, between one and two. One and between two. plus one and plus two. Plus um, one and plus two. Know, we usually think that you know even this mid cavity is uh, accessible and delivery can be contemplated, but sometimes it is very very hard even with the key lens. So in such case, that's why you know we do such deliveries inside OR so that if any problem or if fails then we should go for cesarean section immediately and this should be done by a senior trained person preferably by a consultant and inside OR. so head should be zero by five palpable and uh, station even, should be plus two yeah. mm -hmm. even one fifth palpable you can do this um forceps or instrumental delivery okay but if plus two then you should not do but uh, one by five, they say usually seniors should do because uh, I think the trainees are not doing Keelan. No, train uh, Keelan means consultant, okay? Consultant, okay. And inside what the trainees are doing only outlet forceps. And you know, vacuum is very rarely used. And I have seen even the registrars, they cannot, even consultants, sometimes they cannot use this uh, vacuum. Mm -hmm. They can't even apply it on the correct position, the correct side. So, you know, these instrumental deliveries are very important throughout this Ireland and UK. And they, are, they will do, if there is any problem, they will take help of uh, forceps. And vacuum is used rarely, but forceps, they are used very frequently. Like I said, even for VPAC, they will prefer to use outlet forceps because they are the quickest way to achieve a delivery. 
similarly if they give you someone uh, where the, uh, as they give you a case where there is already some fetal distress like fetus is having bradycardia in that case also don't apply forceps because it can also since it will cause vagal stimulation so again your baby can have further bradycardia so in that case mm -hmm. also you should use um, outlet forceps or mid cavity forceps depending upon the station of the head it is the point so if they will bring any of these things they will ask you about the indications contraindications and you should not be worried sometimes they will simply ask you that which handle you are going to introduce first so you are going to put the left one first and then the right one then lock them and then pull them out with contraction okay and don't forget to say uh, you will have a dummy but you should say that you will take consent you will explain the risks and benefits and then you will proceed regarding the geek consent guidelines actually you don't have to remember them you are supposed to mention just the main problem. Fetal, fetal injury can be there. Keppel hematoma can be there. Can be more, um, or you know, this serious hemorrhage can be there. So you have to take permission from the patient. So okay. And feel more fetal concerns with the vacuum. So you you have to mention just a couple of points and you're fine. You don't have to remember full consent guideline. Just mention two three points. What do you see here? Yeah, this is the uh, uh, this um, silistic cup bandus, and the down it is the kiwi omni cup. So, what is the benefit of using kiwi? Uh, kiwi basically it is uh, uh, it is available on uh, in the uh, easily available and it is handy and. Uh, uh, everyone can use it. It does not require special training, but um, uh, it, it can be applied um, and it cause less trauma uh, to the mother and to the fetus. So where should it be applied? Where should what? What is the point where you will apply this cup? If you, if you are doing any type of vacuum extraction, any sort of instrument like you are using kiwi you are using stylistic cup where you will apply point the yeah we will apply yeah, we will apply the flexion point uh, where, which is the six centimeter uh, three centimeter anterior to the posterior fontanelle and six centimeter behind the anterior fontanelle basically it is the vertex and yes. uh, at that point we should apply the kiwi cup okay so if you cannot determine the position of the head do you think that we should proceed with operative delivery instrument no we delivery? should not uh, then we, we should, should not proceed yeah we should not and we should either call the senior or we should prepare the cesarean a patient for cesarean section yeah so we have some contraindications for using vacuum extraction so can you tell me about some contraindications for the use of vacuum extraction yeah, Ventus should not be used if the uh, if it is preterm pregnancy, like less than 34 weeks. In between 34, 36 weeks, also we have to be cautious. And uh, if it is uh, uh, like uh, face presentation, and then uh, if the mother has infections like uh, H HIV, hepatitis C, herpes, mother, there is relative contraindication. And then if there are inherited bleeding disorders in the mother then also we should not use uh, operative vaginal delivery and also if the baby has is suspected to have fetal allomune thrombocytopenia or osteogenesis imperfecta in those cases also we should not apply the uh, ventus or forceps yeah so thank you so there are specific contraindications for the use of vacuum extraction which include fetal position is undetermined fetal head still above the scale spines, mal presentations such as face or breach, then inability to achieve a proper application of cup, then prematurity if the baby is less than 34 weeks, suspected fetal breathing problems, assisted delivery under general anesthesia because uh, you need maternal efforts. Okay? So if she's under general anesthesia, still you can do um, this forceps delivery but not vacuum extraction then what is the reason 
you know uh, if you are doing using uh, ah, okay pop, patient is not pushing okay okay yeah, patient, patient will not pushing yeah, okay. patient is under general anesthesia anesthesia okay okay like you when you plan uh, you are doing a cs but you think that head is very low you examine her again and the head is you know better than before so you will apply forceps and since you don't need maternal effort you are just going to pull the baby out so you can use forceps so it will be a contraindication for using um, vacuum extraction if the patient is under the effect of GA because she won't be able to uh, push and we need her to push if we are doing a vacuum extraction. Then if she has any contraindication to maternal pushing like uh, in cases of class 3 and class 4 heart disease, that is the thing. You know, you will answer just in one line or two lines because they are going to show you at least seven items so that's ah, why okay. like okay, so, so it will be a 10 minute station in and they will yeah, show many minutes station yeah as we practiced yesterday with labor board and orla prioritization so they can give you a document they can give you an audit or they can give you some protocol patient in police that and they can ask you to comment on that okay that is the reason so for that you, you will have a rest station usually before the scale station so you will sit there and then they will ask you different questions so they if can, cardiac disease or hypertensive disease grade three four then we should apply forceps not when to yes yes that is the point use forceps don't use vacuum uh, so you know you don't have to go into details yesterday we talked about uh, repair of this third degree perineal tear so that was enough you don't have to go back to your guideline and read everything okay? just remember the basic things mm -hmm. okay then dr asma are you there uh, yes doctora i'm here what do you see here yes i see an ultrasound no, sorry x-ray image for uh, the uterus, uh, probably that is uh, uh, HCG um, examination, hysterosalpingogram, um, and uh, this is a test which uh, shows uh, us uh, about the trying give us uh, informations about uterine cavity and uh, tubes, vacancy of the following tubes. And uh, it uses uh, the radio opaque uh, contrast. There are there is uh, oil based contrast. There is also fluid based contrast. But now we are mostly using the fluid base because it's more convenient and it's um, uh, it's also ne no delay in uh, having the post uh, uh, post village uh, image and the X ray. And in this uh, here test, it's showing like um, by it can be either uh, by coronate or it is uh, septated uterus. Incomplete septum is here, and um, there is uh, from the right tube there is a spillage of the outside the tube, but there is also like dilated tubes. It looks like maybe hydrosalpinix is there. But the left tube is completely uh, blocked. There is no spillage, and the tube cannot be seen here uh, on the left side. Okay. So here they have done hysterosalpingography. Okay. So mm -hmm. maybe this. So this one looks like a bicarbonate uterus. Why I will say that? Because you know, in bicarbonate uterus, if you will pay attention from the carnal end of the uterus to the Middle, middle point the distance should be 1.5 centimeter so this one looks like um, more than 1.5 centimeter but we don't know exactly mm. so in cases of septic uterus they should not be this much wide gap okay? it should be less than this one mm. so they will be closer but there will be a defect so by coming mm. mm. so our COG said that we should not be doing hysterosalpingography anymore we should do saline infusion sonar hysterography but for RCPI, you can still offer hysterosalpingography. So then they will ask you, what are the indications for doing hysterosalpingography? Mm, uh, this is uh, mainly uh, the main indication to for infertility, one of the infertility investigations to check the patent's use tube and the cavity if there is intra-cavitary lesion. Uh, also, it can show us any... Um, 
uh, lesions like uh, intracavitary polyp or fibroids. Um, um, that's it. Uh, dilated tubes before the infertility treatment, also if as and before IVF, like. Uh, uh, an indication if there is a hydrosalbenics, this is uh, one of the indications to do salbenjectomy or uh, before going for IVF treatment. Okay, so can we do other tests to assess tubal potency? Yes, there is hystero, uh, sonography also, which is uh, using the normal saline and uh, that will be under ultrasound. Uh, guidance and also if the patient is having uh, any morbidity like history of infection or history of uh, uh, operation abdominal surgery before uh, we can do lab uh, laparoscopy and dye test okay so mm -hmm. will you like to do any test on patient before going for hysterosopenusrophy yes uh, we should do screening for the um, um, sexual transmitted infection. Uh, we will take swabs, uh, vaginal swabs and endocervical swabs before or uh, if the patient doesn't agree for swabs, we can cover her with antibiotic before doing the, birth, the procedure. Okay. So, uh, do you think you should exclude pregnancy before doing this procedure? Yeah, of course. Yes, yes, sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, actually, the timing uh, of hysterosalbenography, usually we do it uh, like uh, eight to ten days after the period to avoid the period of the ovulation and uh, possible pregnancy. But uh, of course, it is definitely we need also, yeah. we cannot guarantee, so we need to do a pregnancy test before. Yes, you should do that. And then they will ask you next question. In which phase of the of a cycle you will do this test so then you will see immediately yeah. after uh, mm -hmm. periods like mm -hmm. in the first 10 days of the cycle yeah. so and then the, if they ask you about the patient selection then you should say that if the patient has his, uh, no history of comorbidities like PID endometriosis mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in that case you should do uh, hysterosalpingography or saline infusion sonohistrography so, mm -hmm. but if patient has history of comorbidities, they will ask you about type of problems, endometriosis, PID, so or history of multiple surgeries, then it is better to do the mini lab and diet test. Then mm -hmm. another thing you can do for them is fertiloscopy. Mm -hmm. You can have a look at the tube, phalloposcopy, histography, and then you can, uh, put, you know, this, uh, you can put fluid from the posterior uh, phonix or the pouch of tugus and it will highlight everything. You will just infuse water and then you can see the whole structure. So fertiloscopy, but this is not used in the routine practice. Philoscopy. Yeah. Philoscopy, we, we, we do it. Yeah, you will look at the tubes. Phalloposcopy, hysteroscopy. Mm, but uh, that one we see it from outside, and we don't see inside the tube. We just see yeah. it uh, from inside the pelvis. Only. That's mm. why phalloposcopy, phalloposcopy, because you will have, you should be able to visualize the tubes. That's why, mm. and then hysteroscopy also to see that there is nothing inside uterus. But that mm. is not used in common practice. So mm. uh, just using this mini lab of diet test, if she has any history of SHD, adhesions, PID, endometriosis, mm -hmm. and if no history, then you will go for hysterosalpingography. So then they will mm -hmm. ask you that um, which substance has been used here. So we have used. So what do we inject if we do hysterosalpingography? Um, it's radio big con it's contrast yeah, anyway, yeah, uh, contrast so then they will ask you will you like to tell something to the patient then like you said they can develop allergic reaction or they can have anaphylaxis or renal failure so we need to tell the patient before doing anything okay? mm. and then they will ask you that so what is your diagnosis here by carnoid uterus and there is village the right side but the left tube is blocked because no peritoneal spillage here okay. 
So next, Dr. Fariha. Thank you, Dr. So Dr. Fariha. Uh, you're welcome. Yes, Dr. Uh, Aisha. Yeah, what do you see here? Uh, here I can see the uh, imperforate hymen. Okay, so how can your patient present? Yeah, patient uh, will uh, basically patient will be a young female who will be uh, uh, in the age of puberty and she will be she will present with cyclical pain or uh, pain lower abdomen or urinary retention and uh, she can have severe pain also and uh, then we have to ask her history and uh, then we with her permission then we will examine her so basically she will have cyclical pain and pain lower abdomen and uh, she can present with urinary tension as well okay so if you come across a person like this who has this imperforate hymen how you would like to fix that problem uh, first of all we will explain to the patient that uh, uh, usually she will be younger so accompanied by parents and then we will explain to them that this is the problem and she is basically having cyclical pain because she is having her cycles but the blood is not coming out so uh, there is a uh, membrane which is uh, covering the hymen and so we just need to give a incision in the hymenal membrane and then she will be fine so we will take her for examination under anesthesia after consent uh, in the operation theater and then we will uh, do a cruciate incision in the membrane but usually it uh, it tends to uh, uh, to make adhesions again so then what we do we do the cruci cruciate incision and then we uh, do the button hole so that it remains open yes that's how we can fix the problem so and then we will call her in the next cycle again to review that uh, she is fine or uh, it has closed again because sometimes there is a uh, chance that it can happen again yeah that's great so can there be any other sort of obstruction in the passage in the vagina yeah there can be longitudinal or transverse vaginal septums and uh, they can also matlab they can present at any age and uh, patient sometimes can have problem with the periods or they can have pain during the periods or they can have like dyspareunia pain during sex and uh, they can present at uh, uh, any time yes that's good okay, so look at this one this is the normal person okay normal like you yeah this is normal yes patient, okay there is no obstruction nothing okay so so these patients they will present with primary amenorrhea and there can be first causes you have to exclude local causes okay like here is imperforate hymen which is a, a hymen is like a double fold of um, epithelium so it is block, blocking the passage okay then you know here you can appreciate another blockade here if it is like this then you will say there is segmental atresia because as we know initially the vagina will develop as a solid cord and then by fifth month of embryological life there will be free canalization okay? so if you see a bigger blockade you will say this is segmental atresia if you will see something like this like here is just one it line you will see that there is septum. So this is transverse septum, Dr. Asha. Transverse. Yeah, this is a transverse vaginal septum. septum. Can be longitudinal also, and if there is longitudinal one, then you will have to think about other problems also. Maybe the cervix is also. Uh, but you know, these vaginal abnormalities they can occur independent of other abnormalities because their uh, vagina is taking origin from different parts. the lower two third from the urogenital sinus and upper one from the mullerian tube yeah they can have renal anomalies in 40% of the cases yeah 40% so you will uh, what should be the next investigation renal uh, we will uh, yeah renal ultrasound so if inconclusive or they they are still having some suspicion then you can send patient for um, mri so then if we talk about other causes of I mean, primary amenorrhea. First, you will exclude local causes, and then you will go to other syndromes, like maybe there is agenesis of vagina or uterus, which can occur in cases of malarian agenesis, and or which is also called yeah, yeah, MRK, yeah, malarian Rokitansky, Custer-Hoster syndrome. Yeah, Custer-Hoster syndrome. 
so she will have breast development because um, she has um, normal ovaries and she will have normal pubic and axillary hair and the fault fault here is that you know she, during embryological period two mullerian ducts will be there first they will fuse and they will form uh, tubes fallopian tubes uterus cervix upper one third of the vagina and then later this area will undergo recanalization sometimes these tubes they fail to fuse or they fail, fail to develop so this patient will have no uterus or maybe this will be like very tiny uterus and uh, the part of the vagina will also not develop appropriately but these people they will, these women they will have normal pubic and axillary hair and and on karyotype they will have 46 x x x yeah makeup okay second thing is uh, old name was testicular feminization but now mm -hmm. we use just androgen insensitivity syndrome sensitivity syndrome yeah uh, so there will be x linked defect in the androgen receptor and all over the body hair growth is dependent upon the level of androgens okay and for the development of male external genitalia you need Uh, dihydrotestosterone that is the active form of testosterone so here the androgen receptor is defective so uh, for the development of external male genitalia we need androgens but here the receptor is defective so these children they will have ambiguous genitalia and mm -hmm. uh, in the absence of since there is no testosterone so all of these androgens they will develop along the line of estrogen so they will have this breast development and pubic axillary hair either they will be scanty or they they will be absent okay and the genetic makeup will be 46x1 okay so which one is more common mullerian agenesis or mrkh or androgen insensitivity syndrome i think mrkh mrkh is that is more common one in 5000 and androgen One in ten thousand, I think. One in ten thousand. One in ten thousand. These figures are quoted in strategy. So that's why you know the number of transgenders is very high. That's why now they are campaigning for their rights and their right to get some treatments. Uh, what are uh, what treatments do they need? Because both of them they are going this, to have. This uh, yeah, they this and yeah. androgen insensitivity basically they have uh, like not proper uh, gonads, so they uh, should be removed when she has attained the puberty, and they can because they can develop into cancer. Then yeah. when we remove the gonads, they will need uh, need the hormone replacement therapy, and as the vagina is short, so they will need vaginal dilators or vaginoplasty. and um, and also psychological uh, consulta consultation consultation yeah re reassurance yeah. and sometimes we have to do some procedure surgical like for vaginal reconstruction vesity or uh, i don't know back endo vaginoplasty uh, but yeah. this is rare yeah they don't they will not ask you about the details uh, details of procedures or the time of these surgeries but you should say that the aims of therapy in both cases are that they should be able to achieve a satisfactory growth and for that we need to elongate yeah. their vaginas and we need and the people with mrkh they can have their genetic children but since they don't have a uterus so they will need the help of a surrogate cell. yeah surrogate both and will then, need adoption and surrogacy right adoption surrogacy in cases of androgen insensitivity since they will not have ovaries so they will have to adopt babies okay and uh, in mrkh also uh, you know you have to elongate vagina and then you will have to refer them for cbt and uh, it will depend on their wish that they want to stay like this or they want to change their gender it's up to them but psychological reassurance is required okay so dr asma me or dr zahida dr zahida sorry yeah Doctor, mm -hmm. like, so actually, you know why I am showing you these pictures? Because in the RCPI skill station, what they do, they will simply bring these printouts, and sometimes they will show you laptop screen and they will ask you to comment on them. Okay. So here are different uterine anomalies. They don't ask you that how they have developed or how these can be fixed. they just want you to identify and tell them that what can uh, why uh, 
what type of problems this sort of abnormality can, can cause in the females. Okay. So can you please comment on these abnormalities? Mm -hmm. The last, starting from the first one is hypoplasia or urgenesis. Uh, hypoplasia or urgenesis, as uh, we mentioned now, it could be the Merck's mere rocket and sky uh, syndrome, um, in which the uterus tubes, uh, cervix, and the upper third of the vagina can be hypoplastic or it can be absent. So the second one is a unicornuate uterus. Mm -hmm. uh, unicornuate uterus. Mm. Yeah, it can have, you know, unicornuate as such. It will not cause any problem. Any there problem as such, problem. yeah. Mm -hmm. but the problem will come. If it has if it is non-communicating yeah if it's a non-communicating type then they they may come with a swelling in the abdomen the thing and severe pain and uh, uh, so in that condition you will have to go for the laparoscopic removal of it uh, and uh, mm, uh, even in communicating, sometimes the coronal pregnancies are also high. Then so, the bike, yeah. Yeah, yeah, please continue. Yeah. yeah. Then we have the bicornuate uterus. Yes, the uh, cases have been reported with the uh, second trimester miscarriages uh, with the bicornuate uterus. And. Uh, can go for the uh, resection of the septum uh, in case of uh, recurrent uh, miscarriages. Then uh, Doctor, can you just come down? I, I can't see the beneath one. Yeah. Mm. And then the septate uterus, partial and uh, complete. The subseptate uterus, again, is uh, risk of miscarriages are high. Sorry, in the septate and the subseptate, uh, complete and the partial septum. In case of such condition, according to the guidelines, I think we can go for the septal resection. We identify this. Then coming to the arcuate uterus, Yes, increased incidence of breach uh, presentations, especially in arcuate uterus. Abnormal presentations have been uh, reported with arcuate uterus. Then the last is a DEC drug related where there is a genesis of the vagina. Okay, you know, when you have, when you say that uh, we should remove uh, this septum, that will be mm. done only in the clinical trials, okay? We will tell the patient okay. that with each uh, loss, mm. Mm. it will increase. The duration of pregnancy will increase and it is possible for her to have a normal pregnancy. Maybe she will have like two, three miscarriages, but with each experience, the size will, the cavity will enlarge. So we will do subtle dissection only in cases of RCTs when we are doing okay. Okay. So communicating all, ectopic pregnancy can develop. Non-communicating, mm -hmm. menstrual blood can collect and there can be pain, okay? So here, there is no cavity or, and here you cannot see any other form, okay? So the problem with this sort of uterus will be that the patient can have a late second trimester miscarriages or you know, what else they can have or they can have preterm labor and delivery. That is the problem. Okay? Okay. So the Go to this one, please. Okay, separate. You have mentioned. Okay, the separate usually will not cause any. If it is complete, then it will cause miscarriages. Otherwise, usually you will not. They are not even recognized. Okay, arcuate not associated with any symptom. So, what about this method, didelphus? What can happen in that? Uterus didelphus.
Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, first patient can have double uterus, double cervix, and uh, you know they can be associated with other with vaginal septum also. So, mm -hmm. the, and it will be discovered only uh, accidentally. And patient mm -hmm. can have seen any of the wombs, okay? and she can have you know she will have if there is no vaginal septum she will continue having bleeding in the same and uh, normal pattern okay she will not have any significant okay. mobility or okay. any other problem that is the point so what about bicarbonate bicarbonate uterus again abnormal presentation can be there with bicarbonate uterus and Mm. Uh, Even the miscarriages, yeah. Mm. If we preterm labors and delivery, that is the point. Yeah. And if patient goes, if it is like complete and patient goes into labor, this is undiagnosed. She will have late second trimester miscarriages, and uh, that's why you know uh, it is most it is just diagnosed accidentally. But there is a special group that those mothers who took diethine still destroy their children. They can have hairpin size of this uterine cavity. So they can have miscarriages or if, if there is blockage, they will not be able to have cheap pregnancies. So they, if they will show you, they, they will show you this nidelphus, this unicarnoid or this bicarbonate uterus. Because uh, they will show you something. Um, where you can uh, you have a chance to do something okay that is the point okay. and usually they have uh, dr asha they have cervical incompetence common in them cervical incompetence yes they will be and unicornuate yeah unicornuate i have seen patients like coming with breach presentation every time you know yeah yeah really they will have milk presentation and they will have uh, they will deliver usually at 32 th between 32 to 34 weeks that is the point and didelphus also i think uh, usually difficult to deliver normally they go for cesarean i think yeah. they go for cesarean sometimes you know i have seen them delivering but you know they will take a long time and then they can also reach uh, they usually they will not be full term they can go for pre-term labor and delivery and, uh, and they can rupture also, I think, easily. Uh, you try and rupture yeah. is common. In them. Yeah. They can also rupture, but we don't have exact um, number evidence from the studies. We don't have exact statistics on that thing. Okay. Just to say that this is double this one. And why it is like that? Because the tubes they didn't fuse or the septum was not removed. So the tubes didn't fuse, and then you know they have developed independently. And then the result is two you try two and two services. That is a problem. If and then in the upper part of the vagina should also be double because that is developing from the Mullerian tubes. Usually, you know, they will not ask you about more complicated things. There will be some something will be abnormal and they expect you to answer them, but they will not go into like all details they just, you just need to tell them that free time labor mal presentation and rupture uterus during okay. labor okay so can we go to the next station for dr Triha. so this is x-ray of a fetus can you see any abnormality here Let's go to a... the... Can we see down because ah, okay, yeah, this the... is uh, that segmentic at... hernia. Um, you know, these are ribs, okay. I will ah, okay. This is like I think this is rickets because these are prominent. Uh, uh, this uh, prominent. rosette, yeah, yeah rosette. Rose. What, uh, yeah. but this is a uh, this is a, a newborn baby, okay. Look at the bones, newborn, okay? yeah. the bones yeah. are constricting or breaking, okay. Or small. Look at this one also. Yeah, this Tables is uh, deformity. Yes, yes. So this and is rickets. Yeah. And blue sclera, osteogenesis imperfecta. Imperfecta. Okay, okay. Skeletal dysplasia. Okay. Yeah, skeletal dysplasia. Okay, that is the point. So osteogenesis imperfecta. Perfecta. Imperfecta. Yeah. So actually, you know, your two is from this blue sclera. Yes. Yes. 
Okay. I don't. There is a name for it. Uh, Harler sign or something. I don't know. Uh, this blue yeah, sphere. Yeah, blue sphere. Yeah, I will agree with you. But you know, they will not ask you about the names. They will just show you a X-ray and X-ray, and they will ask you what's wrong with this baby. So here, maybe these are broken bones. These are malformed bones because the appearance is abnormal. Okay. Uh, here, the, even you, if you will look at the vertebra, okay, they are somehow fine, better. But you know, here you have these problems. So they can show you any kind of fetal congenital abnormality. This is rare. They will not show you, but I just want you to draw your attention. They are short they bones also. Them. Bones are short and yeah, they are bent. Bones are short. A chondroplasia, maybe the head was fine, but the rest of the bones are small. The long bones, okay. The long bo bones are there affected. Then look at this one. These are bending because there is bending, yeah. no proper um, calcification of the bones. Okay. The type 3 is, I think, uh, fatal and it is not compatible with life. The I think this type 1, they are compatible with life. Yeah, these are compatible with life. This They call it brittle bones syndrome also. So you can imagine that very hard to survive because the bones are breaking. Yeah, they are fractures. And fractures. Have any treatment here. Here, you know, uh, they can show you a picture like this. So, of course, they will not ask you to comment on all of these. Okay, there will be some abnormality here for us. The abnormality of um, concern should be of interest should be if this patient is a sickler or not. So, hemoglobin electrophoresis. That's how our you know our script. And this HDSC will be the carrier, and this uh, SS will be the disease. And uh, yes, sickle cell disease. See here, sickle cell disease. Yes, yes. And, uh, so if you will show you a strip, this only this information will be missing here. Okay, but this one will be there because they are telling you what type of hemoglobin is there. So you should know about that. Just one picture, not in detail. Okay. Okay. If you will go on this one, AA, it means normal adult hemoglobin. Right. So the chains, beta chains are there. So this is hemoglobin A, adult type. AF, this is there you are going to see gamma chains. So this is fetal hemoglobin. And uh, if there is hemoglobin S, so it means sickle cell is there. So it will, there can be various combinations. AS means there is adult hemoglobin and there is sickle cell hemoglobin is also sickle cell hemoglobin is also there so as means sickle cell fit if both genes they have mutation then hemoglobin will be of ss type so this is sickle cell disease if ac hemoglobin c trait cc hemoglobin c disease s hemoglobin sc disease so don't be upset to see anything like this right uh, actually uh, in the last two exams in the MRCOG1, they showed them electrophoresis, hemoglobin electrophoresis strips also. Okay? So if they ask you what is this, then you will say on a gel, hemoglobin migrates from the negatively charged, you know, negatively charged cathode to positively charged cathode. So hemoglobin A, it migrates the far farthest. It is reaching the farthest point from the start. So that's why whenever you will see something here, it means that this uh, this type of trait is containing adult hemoglobin. So it is followed by hemoglobin F and then hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C. It can stay close to the cathode. You don't have to go into details. Just remember this one, and I want you to remember these combinations because if in that in the exam question, even in the short cases. They give you that her hemoglobin, hemoglobin electrophoresis was done and found to be AS or SS. Then you should know at least that what exactly they want you to talk about. So what do we see here? So Dr. Zahida. This picture, I will try to announce this one for you. And this is a normal RBC, OK? Yeah, this, this is, is sickle cell. I can't see. Can you just get it this size? That I think I'm using. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine. I can see. see that it's sickle cell. Yeah. Okay. The sickle cells, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, it's a peripheral smear, right? Yeah, it's a peripheral smear, and here are so normal the cells. Yeah. So, sickle cell disease. so, what will be the hemoglobin pattern in sickle cell disease? Not disease is SS and uh, trait can be anything, AS or AC. Mm. So here they are only SC. asking. Yeah. Yeah. But they are usually normochromic and normochromic and normocytic. Yeah, normochromic, normocytic. These are the things. So about the sicklers, we will talk in detail later in, if we are doing some short case. So this was only for the sake of identification. Like they can show you many things. Okay? Usually, you know, the things will be common, but you should have some idea that what sort of things they can show you, okay, so that you are not surprised. So what is the, uh, what is this, uh, what type of disorder is this one? Hemoglobinopathy. What has gone wrong here? Glutamic acid has been replaced by another amino acid, which is called valine. Valine. So what happens? Uh, valine. So what happens? There is less oxygen saturation, this hemoglobin is it will crystallize and then it will adopt the cell will change into a sickle shape it will change its shape into a sickle and then the problem is that these are side because of this crystallization it cannot pass smoothly through the capillary circulation because to pass through the capillaries the diameter maximum diameter should be six micron and now it is more than if you will compare it with this one this one is a bit larger so it cannot pass through the capillaries so they will clog the capillary and they can that's why they can cause micro infarction and destruction of the tissue and due to very same reason they can cause uh, venous thromboembolism also they will ask you about the basic defect then you know in the oscillatory we, we cannot recognize dr Raisha, how many we should pass like the to pass the station how many we need to recognize you know you have to pass the station overall and out of seven stations you should pass seven but trust me you will see very simple things like uh, yesterday we talked about this cusco speculum see? then this dye test in perforate hymen the test results like the patients had some abnormality so you know nobody can remember all normal reference ranges so just compare don't be confused if you don't if you don't know about anything just simply say sorry i don't know much about it because if they are giving you 10 marks and you couldn't identify like two or three. So anyhow, you have identified seven. So you, you will get, get uh, seven points for that. Don't worry at all. Okay. So your aim is to pass the short circuits uh, in, in at least. Don't worry. And the things are going to be very simple. I have taken out the complicated things because the simple things, anybody can comment on them. But these hemoglobinopathies, people have a lot of confusion on them. So thalassemia, uh, you should just remember there can be patient can have alpha thalassemia, can have beta thalassemia. So in alpha thalassemia, alpha globin gene deletion. So alpha globin one globin synthesis will be defective. You just need to remember only this first line. No one is ever going to ask you about it. So the severity of the disorder will increase as the number of affected genes will increase. Even two genes, they have been affected, still it will be a thalassemia minor, they will be. In the first one, when just one chain is defective, no anemia, so per person is a carrier. If they have two defective alpha genes, alpha chains, they will have mild microcytic anemia. Then as the number of abnormal genes will increase, they will have problems and if all four chains they are defective then this is incompatible with life so we call it Bart's hemoglobin Bart's disease and the baby will die why because he cannot carry it just remember in alpha thalassemia defective or decreased synthesis of alpha globin chains decreased synthesis of alpha globin synthesis four chains are there one chain is abnormal nothing carrier two chains are abnormal Yes, mild anemia and then severe anemia and then fourth condition incompatible with life. So similarly, if they give you beta thalassemia, your patient can show absolutely normal findings or they can show microcytic hypochromic anemia. So there are 
point mutations in splice sites. You can see there's some slight mutations in the hemoglobin, and um, there will be defective synthesis of beta globin chains. So it can be minor where the patient will be heterozygous and beta chain is underproduced. So how do we diagnose? Diagnosed by diagnosis is confirmed by increased level of hemoglobin A2 chains and they will be like more than 3.5%. Dr. Fia, you were saying yesterday 2.5. Yeah, 2 this, uh, always they are giving this, you know, <laughs> in this, uh, they are mentioning this HbA2 always. Yeah, so that is, um, it, it should be, it will be more than 3.5. It is more than 3.5%, but the range is that it can be, between, some books say that it will be 2.5. So just remember 2.5, 3.5. It means beta thalassemia minor. In beta thalassemia minor, uh, main, beta chain is absent. Here, in beta thalassemia minor, it is underproduced. And in beta thalassemia major, this in the homozygous, beta chain is absent. So patient can have severe microcytic hypochromic anemia with target cells. Target cells are broken cells. And the cells can be of a normal shape also. And these patients, they will require blood transfusion. Then due to blood transfusions, they can deposit extra iron into their system. So they can have secondary hemochromatosis. Why? Because blood is breaking down and, he, and iron is depositing into several organs in the body. So they can have skeletal deformities. They can have facial changes. They can have extra medullary hematopoiesis. There can be hepatosplenomegaly, increased risk of parvovirus B19 aplastic crisis, and sometimes, you know, they can have more fetal hemoglobin also. So if more fetal hemoglobin, you know, this uh, not more fetal, fetal hemoglobin. I want to say that in the first six months, the babies have higher level of hemoglobin F. So that's why we won't diagnose them. But after that, they will become symptomatic. So uh, we are interested in thalassemia during pregnancy, how it affects us. But, but, you know, to build up your concept, you already have good concepts. You should remember your basics. What is abnormal? What is happening? So at least you should understand if I tell you hemoglobin A2 is more than 3.5. So beta thalassemia should come to your mind. Audit. Many people are very upset to see an audit. We will practice with audit. This is just the smallest shortest possible summary okay if you forget everything then just say these points and you are going to be fine of course we are going to talk about audit in detail but i have summarized this one for you because on the skill station they can give you an audit and ask you to comment on that so you, sh you should say clinical audit is a structured process to continuously evaluate and improve the care received by the patient so purpose is to improve provision of care. It is not done to convict someone or to cause any problem for anyone. So audit cycle, it involves that you should establish criteria and standards. What is the problem? Then collect data, input data, analyze data against criteria and standards. Then you should report and summarize your data. Then, in the light of the findings, you are going to create an action plan. Then you will implement change. And then at the same time, you will decide that when you are going to see a review your practice again. So you can either fix a time limit, like you, you can see we are going to review after two years. Or you can set a number of patients. Like you can say that we will review our practice once we have done 200 cases. Okay, But mostly duration is used. and uh, Usually, it is better uh, if you can re-audit after two years. Then you will do re-audit. And if you have seen significant changes, you will make that part of your permanent protocol. So we will talk about that in detail. So, you know, this was just a test. I just wanted to show you that how many different types of things can be asked. We will practice with more stations also. Don't worry. So, any question, any problem so far? Now it's what very good and clear. Okay, that's good. So let's have a break for 15 minutes. Then we we will try to do a circuit, and then we will do certain other things. Okay.
So take a break for 15 minutes and then please join by using the same icon. Okay. <clears throat> Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I'll see you all in 15 minutes. Um.